So my name is Ruby Warrington, and I'm an author. That's what I call myself these days. <laughs> <laughs> and you're, well, you're more than that. You have your, you have the numinous, you're mm -hmm. an event promoter, mm -hmm. you are okay, you're yeah, a journalist, a you're a speaker. I lead retreats, I'm a journalist. Yes, yeah. all of these things. I'm a, a disseminator of ideas. Mm. And yeah, I guess. A collector <laughs> and a disseminator. Hmm. And so most recently, you wrote a book called Sober Curious. Mm -hmm. And I am curious myself on what led you to write that book. What mm. was your kind of human experience that led up to it? And what are the principal concepts in it? And then we'll unpack that a bit. Yeah, sure. So Sober Curious um, was the terminology I came up with to describe my own evolving relationship with alcohol. I came up with that term about four years ago and started using it um, to describe that journey that I'd been on, which is probably about a 10-year journey at this point. Um, it was only sort of five, six years in that it felt like something I wanted to start speaking about openly with other people um, because I had questions that were deeper and bigger than I was able to answer by that point I guess and it felt like opening up the conversation and just seeing if anybody else felt the same way that I did would be really helpful and it turned out a lot of people did so I'll backtrack a little bit I'm from the UK as you can hear and many people know that there's a really boozy kind of drinking culture in in the UK you mentioned I have a background in journalism which is a you know within that even media is a very kind of like alcohol soaked uh, sort of um, area. Um, so th in my 20s and early 30s, I really, I became a pretty heavy social drinker and it's very much interwoven with my um, career progression. It really uh -huh. helped me kind of like get up the career ladder to be at the right parties, networking with the right people. Exactly, exactly. Right. Um, but I kind of got to a point um, where I was going through a period of real extreme anxiety a um, lot of it work related. It was in a really high pressure role at that point, high status, high pressure role. And I found it, it was this anxiety I was experiencing was really exacerbated anytime I drank. And mm. on the flip side, I was possibly drinking a bit more to kind of relax harder or switch off harder when I could, if that makes sense. And I began to really question, even though I wouldn't have described my drinking as alcoholic drinking or what I thought of at that point as alcoholic drinking, which, you know, the image that we have of an alcoholic is like somebody who needs a drink as soon as they wake up in the morning, is drinking every day, is regularly blacking out and has had some dire life consequences. None of these things were occurring in my life. Um, and yet I, it became harder to ignore the fact that, al that alcohol was actually having an a more of a negative impact on my overall well-being than any of the kind of benefits I thought I was getting from it, which were, you know, relaxation, social socializing, etc. And so I began to question, like, how is, why am I using this substance? And why is it kind of expected of me to use this substance? And why are there certain situations when it feels like if I don't use this substance, I've kind of ruined everybody else's night. Like all of these things, right? Yeah. As soon as you step out of what I now have come to term our dominant drinking paradigm, it's like everything becomes illuminated and like, whoa, hold on. There's so many unspoken agreements that we kind of signed up for when it comes to drinking without question. Yeah, well, it's also you look at, I guess, the cultural piece of it where it, it's essentially applicable to any situation and even the flip side of it, like, I got this great promotion. Let's have a drink. Totally. Like, I got fired. <laughs> let's, let's have, have a drink. drink. <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> like, I had a baby. <laughs> like, yeah. Let's have a drink. Exactly. Oh, my grandfather died. Oh, we need a drink. Essentially, it has become the go-to panacea for just a m any, any anything. And it's often, if you're a, a quote-unquote normal drinker, who hasn't experienced the kind of problems that might be deemed a rock bottom, which would take someone mm. to a recovery program, you and there's not never at any there's never an opportunity to question, and so we're sort of blindly, I think, yeah, um, mm. yeah continuing yeah, to participate. Yeah, I think this is the real important distinction, you know, from your work because obviously, um, 
alcohol use disorders and alcoholism, like acute alcoholism affects, you know, 20 million people just in this country. So severe at Mm. huge scale. Mm. But I think maybe what you're addressing is a bit more like insidious in a way, like you could limp through life as kind of a semi-functional regular drinker and just never address it Mm. right yeah that's exactly it that's a really good way and i'm loving that even the languaging of just like limping through life and you're limping through life and maybe you're having an occasional panic attack and maybe you don't have any energy because you're not sleeping properly and we never think maybe it's the alcohol because the media, the booze industry, like society in general, conditioning just tells us alcohol is the answer. Mm. If you're feeling shit, have a drink. <laughs> if you're feeling great, have a drink, as right. you said. So I began to question it, and I, and I eventually came to term that questioning being sober, curious, you know? Mm. Because I knew that you're, I did... You're I, a fine journalist, <laughs> Ruby. <laughs> I do love, I do love a, a t- some new terminology. Yeah, you have quite a few of them. I do. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And I, and I came up with that term. I really thought, like, what other area of life are we allowed shades of gray? Hmm. And I thought about sexuality and that now quite outdated term, by curious, like, <laughs> you know, where someone's kind of, hmm, I'm not exactly sure which side of the fence I fall on here. Maybe I'm going to allow myself some wiggle room and some experimentation and some curiosity and some questioning about what works for me. I think for so long we've had this very black and white polarized paradigm of like there are fucked up drinkers and there are normal drinkers and there's just nothing in between. And I think what's widely recognized now is that actually there are as many shades of gray as there are human beings in between. And that alcohol dependency, addiction can exist and show up in people's lives in so many different ways. And so being sober curious is really about It's not really about saying this is right and this is wrong or moralizing about it, right? I'm not saying alcohol is bad and everyone needs to stop drinking. I'm not pro-prohibition. If anything, I'm pro like education and information. And what I'm really pro is each and every individual feeling so empowered and so okay and confident in trusting themselves and their own experience, their own lived experience, that they always know what's the right choice for them. Whilst with the caveat, when it comes to a substance like substance like alcohol, which is one of the five most addictive substances on the planet, mm. know the nature of the beast, know what you are dealing with, right? Know that it's probably harder to maintain a perfectly neutral relationship to alcohol than it is to become dependent on some level, you know? Yeah. Right. And, you know, for many people, I think they reestablish plans of attack in their minds of like, well, I'm only going to drink on the weekends, you know, and then slowly it creeps back in and it's just a glass every day and you become a little dull and you can't sleep well and you're having the panic attacks and you have a bit of nausea and you have a bit of adrenal fatigue. Does it sound like a biography or anything? Um, <laughs> you used to work uh, in the music industry, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah. I did. Um, and I think, you know, and and, it, and I think at some point we should talk about sort of the differentiation and delineation between kind of what you're doing and what you're talking about and some of the orthodoxy mm-hmm. in around 12-step programs mm-hmm. in AA, which essentially says, you know, that addresses that idea of your plan. And it's like, well, if your plan was working, <laughs> you, you'd you be fine by now. But clearly yeah. your plan is not working, so you need another plan. And I think what you are might be offering is... Well, here, there's some, for those people that aren't essentially suffering from debilitating disorder, that there is a, there is another way. Mm, Exactly. There is, for me, you know, you, you spoke there a little bit about um, potentially bringing in attempts to moderate your drinking, putting a load of kind of rules around it. As soon as anyone's entered into that territory, there's a problem. Like if you were completely, if you weren't experiencing any negative side effects from the drink, from your drinking, you vis- why would you even be considering, am I drinking too much? Should I limit my intake? Like we all just kind of intuitively know that mm. alcohol is really bad for us mm. <laughs> and that the negatives far outweigh the positives. And for all of us, like wherever we land, I think that's kind of a, a, a truth. 
Um, and although I, w I will say not for everybody, because I do think that everybody's experience based on all sorts of things, based on genetics, based on biology, based on the community and the society that they're living in, based on their, like, their beliefs, based on their spiritual practice, all of these things can impact the degree to which a person may develop a dependence on alcohol, I think. Um, but yeah, we all, we all kind of know that it's not good for us. And I just am like, let's look at why we still engage then. Right. I think that's the, the crux of it is, and I'll use myself as an example in this particular case, is that for many years in social situations, in order to feel less inhibited and more confident, I would have a drink to essentially lubricate my social ability and mm. to become less introverted. Mm -hmm. And that's probably not uncommon. It's, I would say it's very common. And then the question, if you can step back with some degree of awareness and then ask yourself, what is the root cause of that is essentially propelling that decision? Why am I not confident and comfortable in the first place to have a conversation with this person who might have stature at a party? Am I just not good enough? Do I not have the self-esteem? What is deficient about me that I need to essentially use this tool that I know doesn't serve me, mm -hmm. that makes me feel like crap, that doesn't, I can't sleep, fucks up my tummy, the whole thing. Mm. But I still make that choice because there's something about me that's oh. just not oh. comfortable. It's making me, it just makes me like so, I feel so tenderly for all of us when we're in that situation. It's almost like our deepest human need is to belong and to feel accepted and to, to feel included, mm. right? We have such a fear of being the outcast. It's very primal, right? Um, and yet, along the way, all of us learn there are parts of us that are not accepted, that are not okay. And we learn to shut them down. And we learn to become ashamed of them and to not show them for fear of not being loved and not being accepted. Mm. And in my research for So Be Curious, I discovered there's a, there's a part of the brain that's called the right temporoparietal junction. Wow. Yeah, try reading an audio book <laughs> and saying that multiple times in a hurry. Anyway, the right temporoparietal junction yeah. is the part of our brain that specifically switches off the monitor, like monitoring what other people think of us. So to think even about like why alcohol, it's it essentially it 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 stops us from monitoring how we're being received. So we do feel in that moment of drunkenness like it's okay to just be us and we'll be accepted just as we are because we're not kind of like hyper vigilant for like how are you perceiving me mm. so i think that's part of the appeal of alcohol um but then yeah exactly just thinking okay so that we can also zoom out then and go why do we live in our society with this extrovert ideal i quote susan cain's brilliant book quiet um the power of introverts in a world that st can't stop talking <laughs> <laughs> in sober curious and i was really looking at that like why are we why is why are X, why is extroversion so celebrated and why are, why is it you can't trust the quiet ones i'm mm. super quiet and introverted and i'm probably one of the most trustworthy people i know do you know what i mean it's like we have there are so many layers at which you can look at something like that if my social anxiety is around like kind of performance anxiety why do i feel the need to perform this like self this extroverted party outgoing confident self when i'm not feeling that yeah well it is certainly true in our modern society that we are s not comfortable with silence. We really are not. Um, and that was actually a big cultural learning when I traveled to Japan and, and I would engage in kind of business meetings there. There's a lot of comfort with silence mm. there. It's really interesting. In mm. fact, silence in Japan is actually a sign of respect where the person engages in silence after you've said something as a means of showing the respect that he or she is processing that and thinking of a thoughtful mindful answer and the first few times that i went to japan i always had felt the need to fill the empty space in a meeting yeah right <laughs> but actually um 
the notion of silence as has almost something that exists outside of the material world, outside of time and space and location and form. That's like very scary mm. for m many people. Mm. And um, yeah, so in a, you know, the byproduct of that is potentially that we celebrate the extrovert. Yeah. Um, exactly. And we have to, f we, it's almost like we feel like we constantly have to be proving acting selling ourselves like contributing something and w i think it also shows how uncomfortable we are with the concept of just of receiving and mm. the, the yin principle right like it's celebrated to be yang and macho and active and out there and doing it and it's really um the feminine principle the yin the receiving the emotional the sensitive has been so subjugated i think no one wants to like be that as well you can kind of look at it there is, like I said, there is so you can get so deep when you really start unpacking it. But yeah, there are, alcohol enables that dynamic, that extrovert ideal. I think, um, and a lot of us are caught up in that. Yeah. So take that example of essentially someone that is that that suffers from some degree of self confidence and relies on alcohol to some degree as a crutch mm. what are tools that can be utilized that essentially replaces that behavior that doesn't serve with with sometimes the same sort of effect the confidence the self-esteem but without the negative right. consequences again there are several ways to look at this and i think um the first one i mean I, I talk again in the book about something ca I call the confidence paradox. Mm. I too, you, I'm super introverted, bookish. Like I, I do really good. I love podcasts. I do really good. Like one to one, put me in a group, and I'm kind of, mm, uh, mm. when's it my turn to speak? Like you know, it's just awkward. <laughs> um, but you know, if I've been, oh sorry, I'm going to backtrack a bit. Where was I going with that? Because <laughs> there's a couple of things I want to say. Hold on. Okay. So there's something I talk about in the book called the confidence paradox. Mm -hmm. So like you and like many of us, I used alcohol as a way to feel more confident in social situations. And what I was thrilled, like people ask, what's the biggest benefit of being sober curious? And yeah, I could go to the sleep and yeah, I could go for the like great digestion. And I could go for the clear skin and all those things are, are kind of fun. But like the biggest is just how much more confident I feel as a non-drinker mm. and there was a clue actually I used to be you know really in the kind of nightclub scene in the UK as well and I would always kind of look at the, the non-drinker in the room the non-drinker at two in the morning at the party and look at them like kind of envious like wow you're like you're like a rock star I kind of want that you know and what I've realized is that I was essentially teaching my brain from like age 14 which is when I first started drinking to fit in be popular etc I was teaching my brain that I needed alcohol for that to facilitate that confidence. And so there's kind of like, you know, three decades worth of unconditioning around that to be done. So, yeah, I discovered the more that I would kind of like feel the FOMA, as I put it, fear of missing alcohol, <laughs> feel the FOMA and do it anyway and sort of put myself in those situations. I actually realized that being in a social situation with all of my faculties about me all of my mental clarity, sharpness, focus, and not to mention all of my kind of like empathy and feeling senses and intuition about people and situations. With full access to all of that, I actually feel so much more confident in those situations. What I don't find myself doing is hanging out anywhere that I don't feel comfortable. If I'm like, if I'm at a social situation and it feels awkward and, and shit, like I'll leave. <laughs> Whereas my old MO might have been like, I'll have another couple of drinks to get into it. And I just don't do that anymore. And I think again, having the 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 seeing almost seeing that almost as kind of like um, an act, a practice of knowing my boundaries and setting boundaries about what is okay and what isn't okay, and the spaces I feel okay in and the places I don't. Getting really good at putting those boundaries up is another confidence building exercise. So it's not exactly like the tool. The tool is the the not drinking, the feeling the FOMA and doing it anyway, and proving to yourself that you're actually way more confident than you have been led to believe right and i'm sure there's other techniques meditation practices yoga other things that essentially you can utilize 
that have obviously a variety of benefits, but also yeah, psychological I mean, benefits. Exactly. For me, those techniques have been integral to me um, connecting to my intuition, for example. And when I say, I think when we think about intuition, people think very mental and heady. But for me, my intuition, and when I know I'm connected to my intuition, is like, how do I feel with this person? Does this person kind of like have my best interests at heart? I don't know if they do, in which case I'm not going to spend so much time with them. And I say, you know, yoga in particular has really helped with that practice because it's helped me feel my body. Like I can feel when my body's speaking to me through my yoga practice. And so now I'm kind of super attuned to like all the little pings and shivers and feelings that my body is constantly giving me about the situation I'm in and I'm able to act on them. The meditation um, is really helpful, as we know, you know, I'm saying we know like this and I'm sweeping my hand around <laughs> like your listeners here, right. <laughs> as we know. <laughs> I mean, meditation is the number one practice really for just understanding that we are not our thoughts, we are not our emotions, and that we always can find a place of stillness and confidence and trust behind or underneath or within all of that kind of chaos that our outside environment or external environment might be triggering in us. So the meditation practice, which has been pretty strong daily for me for about four or five years now, has just been really integral in terms of being able to listen to that inner voice, which doesn't always sound like a voice. Again, it's more like a feeling or just a knowing and trust it, mm. it and take action on what it's actually telling me. Yeah. And what would you say for skeptics or two skeptics that might wonder if essentially life just becomes a bit sedentary and boring <laughs> without a bit of drink or you know is it possible to let loose and have fun without alcohol and then i'd follow that up and say does alcohol have any place any constructive place in having fun once in a while mm, really good questions alcohol can provide very high highs and it brings very low lows and polarity to that right and I think for anyone um, contemplating no longer existing in that kind of roller coaster of emotion particularly if that's been your norm since you were a teenager or whenever it was you started drinking it, the, 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 the idea I suppose is that out that life could become very monotonous and one note like the highs are worth it for the, the lows are worth it for the highs right but what I realized and what I think many people experience when they remove the alcohol is that, yes, life kind of settles down to this um, a more stable cadence, I suppose. However, we realize what we've been missing is the incredibly subtle but way more sustainable ecstatic states. Like, I find myself often just kind of walking down the street, that annoying person with a huge smile on my face and all my hair standing up on him because like the sky is so beautiful. And I'm just like, who knew I could feel so much? I think, you know, Brene Brown has a brilliant quote, you know, you can't selectively numb emotion, numb the dark and you numb the light. Mm. And while we've been feeding off these kind of um, synthetic man-made or muck highs <laughs> that we might get from alcohol and other substances, and other behaviors, and all sorts of things, right? Um, we're kind of ignoring or just like forgetting the fact that our body is actually really well equipped to bring us extreme states of pleasure when we are tapped into it and when we give ourselves the time. I think what I've, you know, we live in a very time crunched society as well, increasingly time crunched, considering that the demands of um, technology now as well. Um, and so the idea of being able to turn on a high when, when we want to feel good is really appealing. Mm. But it's just not sustainable and it's not real. Yeah. And so, again, creating space to allow our body to just kind of like, I mean, my favorite high is the high of waking up without a hangover. And that, that could sound so sort of basic and, again, like yawn. But <laughs> waking up feeling pleasurable and just warm and comfortable in my body every day like that's i'm never gonna i never want to give that up again yeah and our bodies are biochemically equipped to actually release neurotransmitters and what one might call naturally occurring opioids dopamine mm. serotonin mm -hmm. to essentially make us quite happy and and electric Absolutely. and you know when you're walking down the street with that extra degree of chi shakti natural energy <laughs> 
you know, from a good night's sleep, yes. from all of the components that go into a healthy lifestyle. I mean, yeah, I'm almost 50, so, you know, and, uh, you know, th- it might be like more of a young person's game to be able to like go out drinking and then still feel like that hop in their step the next day. That's certainly long behind mm, me. Mm. But for me now, um, yeah, I agree. There's no better feeling than to feel that sense of mental clarity and energy and vibrancy that like brings you into a conversation or a connection that's highly dynamic Mm -hmm. um yeah exactly and again it's like what are the what are the the kind of like ecstatic states that society has sanctioned a lot of them are accessed through substances which ultimately keep us quite dull and keep us disconnected from our intuition from our creativity from our inspiration because actually more humans being more connected to those things is kind of a bit of a threat to the status quo it means more (laughs) of us having ideas about how we want to do things versus Mm. how we've been told to do things kind of gets quite political Ah, that's interesting so are you (laughs) suggesting at some level that abstinence from some of these substances that are used to essentially numb the masses the opiate of the masses Mm, um right uh, i mean this is right out of nietzsche actually who i think he i'll you know butcher the quote but essentially he said there's, there's been two great opiates for the masses christianity and alcohol he was very against alcohol there you go and that essentially more people that are clear and not affected by external substances might have the energy motivation and ideas to lead revolutions that might end and upend the systems and structures that are oppressing people absolutely yes the confidence the trust in ourselves and how we want to live our lives versus what's been prescribed for us on in every form of prescription if you know what i mean Mm. And then you mentioned again, you know, is there ever a kind of a, a positive use for alcohol? And there is a chapter in the book and I wondered whether to include it or not. It's called The Power of Positive Drinking. And then that mm-hmm. I look at, you know, how alcohol has been used. You're so good. I just got to. It's just. It's, yeah, that's it's just it. You know. Thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I looked at how alcohol has been used ceremonially. It's used in some shamanic practices. Um and in those situations, it's treated with such reverence. It's treated with the reverence that we might think about a substance like ayahuasca, right? You're not going to do ayahuasca because it's Friday night and you feel awkward among your colleagues or like it's just expected <laughs> of you. Although there's a chapter in my first book on the p- feeling the plant medicine peer pressure because that's definitely something I've acknowledged and experienced too. You know, if you're not in the ayahuasca crew, then how spiritual are you? Yes. Whatever. Yeah. Um, but no, so I think that Potentially, yes, alcohol is a medicine. It's a plant medicine, if you like, like many of the others. But the way that alcohol abuse is so sanctioned and enabled by the way that our alcohol culture is organized, it makes it very difficult for us to engage in it safely and consciously in that way. Although I wouldn't expect, I wouldn't be surprised if out of this sober curious moment, we see some people maybe starting to bring alcohol in in those more ceremonial practices and rituals it'll be interesting to see what comes up there yeah right like lcd sound system that's ceremonial and ritual (laughs) no i (laughs) I heard an interview with you at some point okay yeah yeah. so i you know i i mean i now at this point in my path and it's been very much kind of backwards and forwards and experiments here and just bringing this conscious level of questioning to all of my alcohol experience Mm -hmm. i now choose abstinence as my preference because I really do believe another one of my favorite sayings, the only thing you miss out on by not drinking is getting drunk. Yeah. Let me think about that one for a while. <laughs> but what I mean by that is like all I've identified all the things I was looking for in drinking and I have found other ways to access those states, those experiences, whatever it is. So I actually mm-hmm. have zero need or desire for alcohol now in my life. And that to me feels like very sustainable if but if long-term sobriety and not using is the goal that process of questioning and conscious experimentation has actually led to an extremely sustainable sobriety for me i think um yeah but there are occasions when you feel like you can use it for i mean just in kind of similarly um, I mean, you'd never do ayahuasca every night, never have like a, the equivalent of a glass of wine of ayahuasca every night. 
you treat it as something as an experience to unleash something transcendental something transformation yeah, have an absolutely. epiphany yeah, and to so access a different state of consciousness and there's there, nothing, there is nothing wrong with that in fact i think we probably need more of that but you can do that with breath work you can do that with meditation you can do that with yoga you can do it with ecstatic dance like there are so many ways often they're very embodied practices that help us access those transcendent states you can do it in dream work i mean there are many ways to access those different parts of consciousness and i think that actually that's a lot of the time what we're craving is some kind of an escape or a connection to something bigger than this like three-dimensional world that we live in which can feel very limited limited and constricting at times so we want to escape we desire and we need to escape mm. but the substance that's the most sanctioned most readily sanctioned is also the one that can bring us the most pain in a way yeah and i i have never had an experience with alcohol that i would say unleashes sort of a limitless a feeling of limitless consciousness a oneness that i can identify the invisible thread that connects us all you know <laughs> um that there are other substances when ritualized can mm -hmm. provide ex transformational experiences like that mm -hmm. but that's not really one of alcohol's strong points. No, alcohol is essentially an anesthetic. So right. it can create a mirage, I think, of that, of a transcendence. Um, but then again, that's a, this is you and me, and this mi it might be different for someone else. And ultimately what that chapter says is like, this is really about you working out what's right for you. Mm -hmm. My personal recommendation based on my experience is abstinence. And there are, you know, exper ex experimentation and exploration of these other practices and tools to get there but um it might be different for someone else yeah i will and i think i mean what we're seeing is i would say a generational efflorescence of um of this kind of behavior where essentially you know people are socializing with out alcohol mm, and absolutely. i mean to the point where i don't know if you saw this i'm sure you did because you because you're on top of this subject, but like Bud Light just launched a seltzer. <laughs> I did not see that. Or a club soda. Yeah, okay. And when, when you have essentially Anheuser-Busch, who's last to the table generally <laughs> when it comes to <laughs> dealing with alcohol, um, launching essentially an alternative that gets like marketed right there at the bar with the, you know, um, yeah, on the fountain, you know, next to mm. the draft beers or whatever, mm. you know, that says that, like, this is a mo there's something mm. here. This is a real, um, there is a movement around seeking an alternative way to socialize and, and have fun and be together. Absolutely. And I think there are a few things playing into that. I do think that, I think that the way that we interact with technology now is literally sh rewiring our brains. Yeah. And alcohol is, as a substance, just is very incompatible with the way that we're expected to kind of show up and communicate and be in the world now, which, th you know, there are two sides to that coin as well. Is it good that we feel the need to be on all the time and that we are, you know, we're, we're operating in this kind of like productivity optimized mindset of like every moment has to be productive and I must always be like achieving, you know, that's very much enabled now and I I'm not pro that <laughs> either, you know. And then I also think that the fact that marijuana is becoming so much more accessible and legalized in most in many places, people are using it, prob possibly using that. And prescription drug use is obviously through the roof, so people yeah. are using that. Like there are just alcohol is kind of messy compared to a lot of the other substances or numbing substances that people have access to now. Yes, that is true. And while I would favor marijuana in general um, in terms of its physiological and psychological effects i still have skepticism and worry around the notion that we continue to try to address our happiness and solve our discontents through the consumption of things that are outside ourselves yes and <laughs> me too jeff <laughs> <laughs> yeah and uh and even though like you know we i live 
here in, in Los Angeles and essentially every other store now is a dispensary that, you know, for me, marijuana usage was like, I'm going to sneak by in the dumpster and like you smoke a joint, you know, now you literally walk into the, and it's like the Apple store and some mm. young millennial woman with a nose ring comes out with an iPad and says, hello, Mr. Krasnow, how are you? Um, <laughs> so the experience is like completely different. Um, and, um, but I still worry about it and I'm concerned mm. about it. I have teenage daughters, mm. um, that essentially, you know, having fun, which is just really a way to say connection. Mm -hmm. and, is, and not working, like not feeling like you have to be proving or working or yeah. Yeah. Is that there's always a, oh, well, I need this to feel whole. I need this to connect, mm. you know, s this thing outside of me. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that's not good. No, it's not good. And it's, well, it's not good, I think, because it's not getting to the heart or the root of like those questions you brought up initially. Why do I feel it's, yeah. it's so hard to relax? Why do I feel it's so hard to switch off and unwind? Why do I feel like I'm not accepted in this group of people? And it's really only when we can start to look at those deeper whys, I think, that we can kind of begin to unravel our need and our reliance on the external things to kind of paper over the cracks. I mean, I've really identified a rampant workaholism since yeah. removing alcohol. And I really, I love the way you're nodding. You're like, oh, yes. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I ah. totally know as much as the kind of introverted, more confidence thing. Alcohol was the only way sometimes that I would switch. Could My body was going, you need to switch off from what? You need to get right. out of your inbox. Drink. It's the only way it could shut my brain down. So my practice around that has been getting comfortable with doing nothing, mm. which I have so much resistance around that. I'm being lazy. I'm wasting time. I have so many ideas that need to get out into the world. But literally clearing a day in my calendar, which is probably usually Saturday for me, when I literally am barred from everything i remove like i delete my social media apps off my phone i have office hours around instagram yeah it deletes off my phone i've had to put those really clear kind of physical boundaries in and find other ways to relax i mean it was right. really interesting to notice how some of my when i was really you know getting into getting going through the weeds of like removing the substance some of my strongest cravings would actually come up when i was feeling super like high already and super excited and it was almost like I wanted something to bring me down because I had this abundance of kind of creative energy that just wanted to create and do and make things. And there wasn't anything to put it in, yes. you know, yeah. it's just very interesting to watch all of those, the impulses. Right. And it's often hard to remember that wisdom comes in the spaces. Mm. Creativity and imagination mm -hmm. often comes in the spaces. Mm that we are so conditioned to push, 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 to make the thing happen. If only this and only if this, then I will get to the next place that will then make me happy. Then I have to get to the next place. And of course, you know, that's a, a treadmill. Yeah. And that actually finding silence, space, serenity, contemplation, a hike, downtime, Often in those moments is when the wisdom or the inspiration comes. Mm -hmm. and But it is very hard to live with that awareness and, and remember that. Um, and so in some ways, <laughs> we have to like create a, a Google Cal yeah. <laughs> for in order to help us. Absolutely. Um, find that time that is just quiet and unscheduled exactly exactly because really i mean i i've been toy I, it, it's not going to be so i'll talk about it but i was putting together a, a book proposal idea around the idea of success addiction and what you just described mm. is that like and i was thinking about that term we use oh so and so made it and i'm like made it where exactly made it where you know we cr we we look to constantly be we were constantly kind of on the tail or chasing the tail of our next success because we have this idea that like achieve this thing, get this thing, make that thing. And then I'll have made it. And where have we made it to? We've made it to a place where we've 
don't need to work, right? Where we're supported, where we trust that we're just divinely supported for just being us. That's what mm. we all ultimately are craving. So how about we just choose that right now? Right. We could choose that any moment, you know? Yeah, well, I mean, this is at the core of Buddhism, really. <laughs> you know, that essentially we're yes. all suffering. There's a way out of this suffering. And the way out is essentially to cultivate a practice that relieves us from desire. Mm -hmm. And that we're, all, we're always essentially feeding what is keeping us in a constant state of suffering, dukkha, which would be is essentially continuing to fidget literally and figuratively to essentially address these desires. Mm -hmm. And the way out is to essentially develop practices that bring about a sense of calmness, serenity, mm -hmm. equanimity, mm -hmm. peace, and cultivate consciousness, if you will, yeah. that brings us out of the practice of continually chasing ephemeral solutions to address these desires. And exactly. obviously alcohol is one of them. And it's about cultivating a sense of enoughness. Like, you know, I have enough, I am enough. Like, that's right. the, the antithesis of our sort of capitalist consumer con culture, basically. Um, so, yeah, it, yeah, again, <laughs> you, can go, you can go super deep with this. And fun fact, Jeff, I have the same birthday as Betty Ford. <laughs> and the day that the Buddha's birthday is celebrated in the U.S. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. My God. So I you're know. destined not to drink. You have no free will. It's just determinism. None. It's my destiny. <laughs> 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 so last thing. Um, I know for a good while you were organizing events, social events, that mm -hmm. were essentially non-alcoholic. Mm -hmm. You're still doing that? No, I took a step back from that because I found myself becoming an event organizer, and I'm, that's not. I'm a. I'm a writer, and I, I. You know, I like. So now I'm. I. I. I do retreat still. I love to go really deep with people. So I have a retreat coming up at Kripalu, a sober curious retreat, which is like two days when we get deep into some of the, have loads mm -hmm. of different exercises to help people get deep into answering some of these questions for themselves. Um, and I'm doing I'm doing kind of appearances and events, but I'm not organizing events anymore. It's just not. That's fast track to burn out for me. <laughs> I know what that's like. Yeah, you do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this has led me down many <laughs> unhealthy paths. Right, exactly. And, so and burnout, like when yeah. I'm in, the, I know when I'm in that burnt out state, I'm more likely to reach for some kind of a, what seems like it might be a quick fix to give me more energy or help me to relax or whatever it is. I don't want to, I don't want to go down those paths. So I'm really, part of the sober curious path has been about like what really serves me in terms of my professional life what really supports me so that I can do the work that I'm really here to do, you mm. know? Do you have to sort of disavow some of your old friendships and relationships when you take a sober, curious, or non-alcoholic path? Um, I w it's more of a, a gradual sort of evolving, I suppose. Mm. Um, I sort of feel like, and, you know, this is a good, I can tell you a bit about, when it really kicked in for me, my my sober curiosity really kicked in after I moved to the US. And so I kind of found myself, and it was around the time that I was launching the Numinous, and I was really getting very involved with the sort of modern spirituality scene. And I found myself just naturally socializing with people who were on this path that we've been discussing, who were more concerned with what can I find within me rather than what can I consume to make me feel better on the outside. Mm. And so there was a kind of a natural shift. And I think that, you know, there's that saying that we're the average of the five people we spend the most time with. And I think that kind of works two ways. And when we are undergoing any kind of internal transformation, we start to just naturally attract different people on a different energetic frequency and the other relationships kind of just fade away. There's no need for it to be a big dramatic, like, al although in some right. situations, if you, if there are people, you know, are like super triggering for you. And if you're with them, you're going to want to drink. You may find yourself, can we meet for brunch or can we go for a hike instead? And then if there's nothing, if there's nothing in common on that hike and the spark's not there anymore, then you just kind of know right. this isn't for me going forward, you know? Yeah, there's a wonderful Wayne Dyer quote that I've come back to <coughs> quite often, which is, the angels we wish to attract into our lives will appear when they recognize themselves in us. Ah, 
that's it. Yeah, that's and my way more eloquent than what I just said. Well, <laughs> I didn't say it originally. <laughs> I just barely remembered it. Um, um, but that I do find that when I, and this could apply to any behavior, not just abstaining from alcohol, but I, when I find when I am consistently living from my highest principles, this is what I've come to feel is the authentic life, the life with integrity is essentially living that your works and actions in this life are always aligned with your highest principles regardless of external circumstances. Mm. So essentially when I'm living from a place of kindness and compassion and forgiveness and charity, the people that naturally appear in my life are those people that are also living from those principles. Mm -hmm. And this isn't just some foofy law of attraction stuff, mm -hmm. although we can go there. <laughs> But it's really true mm. because essentially people that are like-minded are, are attracted to each other. Yeah. And I, I think that, you know, it wouldn't be a far jump to say living a sober, curious life helps you cultivate an ability to live from your highest principles. And then by extension, those angels appear into your life. Absolutely. That's beautifully put, Jeff. But yes, no, I <laughs> really God completely it was agree with you. Um, because I'll, you could you could put it in a really practical container as well. Sure. Like when I choose to live from those principles and every choice that I make and everything I put in my calendar goes through that filter first, there's just a natural reprioritization repri mm. of who you're spending your time with and where you're putting your energy. And so the other stuff will just get crowded out by where you're focusing your, where you're literally spending your time and energy, you know? Yes, that's a very practical approach. <laughs> to it. You're a very practical woman. <laughs> I've always admired that about you. Um, no, I think, um, well, you, I really appreciate you leading this movement because it, it needs, all movements need a leader. They need a messenger um, who is, charismatic and comes up with absolutely incredible wordplay <laughs> um and uh and it's really having an impact i hope you can feel the impact that it's having oh yeah i have a google alert set up for sober curious and there's like eight or nine mentions a day yeah. of that term you know and it's i think that for me you know there's been some kind of like a few comments here and there why does this need a term it's just like deciding not to drink and i'm like hmm People, and it, you know, going back to the very beginning of our conversation, when I decided I wanted to start speaking openly about this, I had a real moment of like, why would anyone care? Like, this has been such a personal internal thing for me. Like, am I like, am I telling everyone, hey, you've all got a drinking problem, even though you don't know it, it doesn't like a drinking problem, but it is, trust me. Like, is this just really arrogant and, like, mm. super Aries of me? Like, to think that everyone... Yeah, and judgmental and whatever, right, yeah. exactly, and presumptuous, but as soon as I started talking about it, it was as if I'd given a language to something that a lot of people have been thinking for a very long time, mm. often unconsciously. You yeah. know, it was like, oh, yeah, actually, yeah, that's exactly where I'm at. Yeah, and I'm, so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, movements and ideas and big visions need language in order to mm. galvanize people's imagination. I've talked about this recently, but... You know, Kennedy wanted to put a man on the moon by the end of the decade. If he just said, well, we're going to put it, but he called that the new frontier. Mm -hmm. And because he called it that, he, he embodied something. He emboldened a, some language. It actually galvanized people to see something bigger mm -hmm. than themselves. Mm -hmm. That they could feel part of something of a movement that was bigger than their own individual plights and in, in their own individual lives. And, you know, um, and, you know, you could make, you know, the New Deal, you the Great Society, mm -hmm. all of these other essentially movements that needed a name mm -hmm. to instill them with force and meaning and excitement. So and I, I think, think with great. this as well, it's like it's given a common language that can actually encapsulate or speak to a multitude of very individual and unique experiences 
that are often rooted in feeling, hunches, intuition that don't necessarily mm. have, like people haven't even had the language to express. And now they can just say, I'm sober curious. And it that's like enough, yeah. you know? <laughs> Good. I love it. I'm sober curious. I'm happy to hear it. I hope you're enjoying it. <laughs> <laughs> so far, so good. Yeah. Thank you, Ruby. It's so lovely to connect with you after a couple of years and mm -hmm. just see how both of our paths have evolved in kind of a parallel way. It's mm -hmm. beautiful. It's great. Thanks yeah. for having me on, Jeff. Yeah. Thank you for coming on. <laughs> well cool. Done. That was fun. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, you must be enjoying this. You're really good at it. <laughs>